So I'm Paul Dart. I'm an yeah. MD. I practice in Eugene, Oregon. I grew up in Eugene, graduated from South Eugene High School, went to the University of California in Santa Cruz, where I majored in psychology. I returned to school in 1978 to study pre-med and went to the Mayo Clinic's Medical School in Rochester, Minnesota, graduated in 1984. Uh, I did an internship at Oregon Health Sciences University in family practice, then a fellowship in uh, environmental medicine in Chicago, and I practice full-time in Eugene. My practice is limited to osteopathic manipulation and it's environmental good. medicine. I see a lot of people with chronic pain, headaches, that kind of thing. Um, as Dr. Paul uh, said, the FCC guidelines address the thermal effects of our F exposure, and he's discussed in some detail that there's a great deal of evidence suggesting that there are biological effects that occur at much lower power levels. I'm going to talk about two different kinds of problems, acute symptoms from RF exposure, symptoms people get, uh, such as headaches, uh, pain, uh, behavior changes, various things like that, that are often referred to as uh, electrical hi electrical hypersensitivity syndrome, or EHS. And then I'll talk about some of the chronic changes caused by damage to DNA, um, cancer, and infertility. And what I'm going to do is show you the results of research in the literature on this subject. Um, the acute symptoms of microwave radiation were first uh, uh, described by Russian researchers in the 1950s, and the Russians used their knowledge of this to harass the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Between 1953 and 1978, they, they beamed uh, microwave radio at the embassy from a roof of another building nearby, exposed uh, embassy staff, uh, experienced uh, statistically significant excess of several problems, depression, irritability, concentration problems, memory loss, ear problems, skin problems, vascular problems, and some other health difficulties. All this was studied by an epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins uh, at the request of the State Department. Uh, in Lenora, Spain, in 2001, researchers compared symptoms of residents within Circle A compared to residents in the Area B, outside these two circles. Uh, area B was uh, uh, more than 250 meters from the cell tower that had been installed in the city. And they found uh, significant differences in various symptoms. Uh, when you see an asterisk here on top of one of these bars, that means that there's a statistically significant difference between this value and this value. So we're comparing people far away, versus people close to the tower, and we have in these symptoms uh, significant increases with people closer to the tower. Um, and uh, the average exposure close to the tower was 0.11 microwatts per centimeter squared. The FCC guidelines are for exposure are 600 to 1,000 microwatts per centimeter squared. In France, uh, uh, research was done uh, in urban environments questioning uh, 530 people who live near cell phone towers. And uh, they looked to see, they stratified the data by how far from the tower these people lived. And at areas closer to the tower, they saw a statistical significant increase in symptoms including irritability, headache, sleep disruption, depression, memory loss. The dose falls off by the cube of the distance from the... Yes, yes, the farther you get from the tower, the, the le fewer people are complaining of these symptoms. Exactly. Cube? It's a square. No, the cube, I think, right? No, it would be, the, well, the simple mathematics of it is the square of the distance, but it's not that simple when you're using a pulse beacon that's, that's directed in certain directions. So um, it's not quite as simple as that, but it's with the square of the distance of what we were taught in our physics classes. Yeah. A city in Egypt uh, where they installed a cell phone tower uh, in 1998, researchers studied 85 inhabitants living near this first cell phone tower in the city and compared symptoms of various kinds to people living farther away from the tower. And 
uh, exposed individuals uh, had significant increase in headaches, memory changes, dizziness, depression, sleep disturbance, tremors, and same in some other things too. Um, this talk is very truncated. Um, you're going to get a PDF copy of this that's that's like an hour and 20 minute discussion, and and there's more data in all of these studies that I'm showing you uh, in this brief talk. In Denmark. Uh, Several studies were done uh, on the Danish birth cohort, uh, where half the, the women in Denmark were asked to fill out questionnaires before pregnancy, and they collected a lot of data. And then they looked at the health status of these children at age seven uh, years of age. They found a, and they were comparing in this study uh, cell phone exposure during the pregnancy and after the pregnancy. And children who were exposed in pregnancy and afterwards had statistically significant increase in behavior problems at age seven. And they saw this increase in all, in all these different uh, problems. This is presumably the mom's cell phone use. Uh, during pregnancy, yes, we can yeah. assume so. The child, the children may have been using them, or the parents may have been using them, and in after that, and that's discussed in more detail in the articles. I don't have time to parse it out in that yeah. level of detail. Um, uh, they saw, as they looked at how much the cell phone was being used after delivery. Once you got up to two calls a day or more, you started seeing a significant increase in symptoms. Um, so it wasn't necessarily huge amounts of use. Um, they also looked in another study with the same uh, research base, uh, headaches in young children, and saw increase in migraine headaches and in other headache symptoms. Now this is a study that involves, this particular study, 52,680 children. So this is a this is pretty solid data uh, when you uh, look at a group that large. Now, um, this is a, a graph from France showing measurements of exposure levels in urban area in France, and they've increased dramatically between 2000 and 2011 here in this study, in this, in this graphic. And over that period of time, the prevalence of people who self-report as saying, I have reactions to EMF, I react to cell tower cell phones, uh, various things like that. In various studies, these percentages are increasing over time. And that parallels the, uh, the increase in exposures. Um, a reasonable guess right now uh, in, on the, in the West Coast here, research in California s several years ago, three to five percent. This data from various studies, it's, you're all going to get a copy of all of that. Um, but in Austria in 2004, two percent of the population self-identified this way. Uh, in 2008, um, 29 percent said they had some adverse reaction, and three and a half had enough difficulty they consulted a physician about it. Um, now I'm going to shift from talking about electrical hypersensitivity to discussing uh, DNA damage and its consequences. Um, this is a picture of a very sensitive assay uh, for DNA damage. You take, you expose a rat's brain and then you sacrifice the rat and take a lot of the cells, separate out the DNA, separate out the different chromosomes, and have them migrate under an electric charge through a, a media. And if the chromosome uh, is intact, it'll all migrate together. But if it's been fragmented, the fragments are different weight, different electrical charge, and you get a comet-like tail spread out behind the main migration. You can measure the the length of this tail and and quantify the amount of fragmentation in the DNA and it's been demonstrated here on this uh, we're talking about an exposure two hours a day for 35 days at one-third of the FCC exposure limit and we see significant uh, increase in length of the head and the tail meaning there's more fragments of DNA and Mold dozens of studies have been done now uh, showing this and showing it with increasingly weaker levels of signal. Um, at the same time, you can document a decrease in the present, the amount of oxidants in the tissue, of antioxidants in the tissue, because they're getting consumed by oxidative stress. And you can show a decrease in melatonin in the exposed animals. Um, uh, because when you produce a lot of 
of uh, free radicals of oxidation, then you have to, have to consume these antioxidants to defend the tissues against it. Now, if you create a lot of damage to DNA, there are going to be health consequences to this, uh, and that'll include uh, the promotion of cancer, reduced fertility, and some other things. Um, this is an epidemiologic study looking at uh, the, the health of all members of the American radio relay, the ham radio operators in Washington, California between 1971 and 1983. This is the expected mortality risk. This is the actual mortality within the group that was using radio in their hobby quite a lot. They were members of this association. Um, leukemias were elevated uh, significantly in several different categories in terms of deaths uh, in this group compared to what you would expect to see in the population. This is a study of Polish military personnel exposed to uh, radar and radio uh, microwave exposures, looking at incidents of various kinds of cancers, and we see an increased incidence statistically in all these cancers with a greater emphasis on the leukemias. This is a study of Air Force personnel, uh, who, and the, the study stratified by the intensity of their calculated exposure based on their job. Pilots have more exposure, they're up front where the radio is, and um, how many months they had that exposure level. They stratified <laughs> it out that way and saw an increased odds ratio for brain tumor above a certain level of exposure. In uh, Netanya, Israel, a cell phone tower was set up in 1996. Um, and you see, the tower was right down here at the coast, so the exposure started here and went into the city. Uh, the power density in the exposed area uh, where they researched this, this study was far below 0.53 microwatts per centimeter squared. It was a thousand times less than the FCC permitted guidelines for power exposure. And what they did was compare cancer rates during the second year of exposure. Good exposure at the source? This is exposure in the neighborhood. In the neighborhood. In the neighborhood, outside the buildings the people were living in. Um, and they looked at the cancer rates in 677 long-term residents compared to 1,200-some uh, match controls living farther away in another area of the city. This is the first tower put into this city. And this is what they saw during that first two years. People, this is the city as a whole, far from the tower, close to the tower, significant increase in female cancers uh, and... Uh, um, this is male, female, and combined. Uh, breast cancer appears to be uh, particularly susceptible to this kind of problem. In uh, Austria, there was a cell phone tower. Uh, this is the older analog cell phone tower operating from 1984 to 97. And they did a case control study of cancer patients living within 1,200 meters of this tower. And they measured the exposure levels on the exterior of their residences. <coughs> And then they statistically crunched the numbers to see what their risk of cancer was. And what they saw um, uh, here, these are the two heaviest exposure levels. This is greater than 1,000 microwatts per meter squared. Um, the FCC guidelines in microwatts per meter squared, 6 million is the permitted levels. Um, and here, these people were exposed to more than 1,000 all cancers, breast cancers, brain cancer, this bar should go up to 121. It, this is 30. It didn't fit on here. Um, significant increased risk. Now, these are studies where you're looking at a town where they put in a tower, one tower in a town, and looked at the data. Uh, a study was done in 2011, published in Belo Horizonte, Brazil which is the capital of uh, Minas Gerais state, population of 2,258,000 in 2010. Um, and it's rated by the UN as having the best quality of life in Latin America in 2007. And by 2006, 856 cell phone towers had been installed in the city. So what the researchers did was they mapped every cell phone tower in the city. They took the health department records to locate the residents of everyone who had died of cancer in the city between 1996 and 2006. And they calculated the distance between the deceased individual's residence and the closest cell phone tower in meters. And this is what they got. This blue line would be the null hypothesis. 
And what they saw was that distances closer than 500 meters, 500 meters or closer, you, you have a, a significant increase in the risk of dying of cancer. Now I'm going to talk about fertility, and there's more on that significant in terms of animal studies in the, the material I've given you than I'm going to discuss here. I'm just going to talk about uh, sperm counts and, and human fertility in terms of sperm. Uh, sperm counts have been dropping uh, since the, uh, the last 20 years, uh, like in New Zealand, 2.5% per year. Uh, there's some suggestion pesticides are implicated, and there's some suggestion that microwave RF may also play a role in this. Here in this study, they took some human sperm and exposed it for five minutes, 10 centimeters from a transmitting cell phone. The power density was 20 microwatts per centimeter squared, 30 times less than the FCC permitted limit of 600. Um, and what you see is you've got fewer fast sperm, fewer slowly progressing sperm, more sperm that aren't moving at all after five minutes of exposure. This study uh, didn't like being converted from Keynote to PowerPoint. This slide didn't. But what they looked at was uh, 361 men being evaluated for infertility. And they divided them into four groups uh, according to their active cell phone use. I mean, they picked men being evaluated because they were getting sperm samples from them in a clinic. And uh, this group was not using a phone. This group's using it less than two hours a day. Here, two to four hours a day. Here, greater than four hours a day. And individuals using a phone uh, um, two or more hours a day had significant decrease in sperm count, mobility, motility, I mean, viability, and normal morphology. In this study, they exposed sperm for 16 hours uh, under isothermal conditions. So there was no question that heating had anything to do with it because they, they eliminated that variable. Um, and uh, what they saw was uh, decreased vitality and motility, increased reactive oxygen species, free radicals, uh, in, in sperm cells and in mitochondria within those sperm cells. A study in Argentina published uh, 2012 took sperm and incubated them at room temperature, uh, lap distance from a laptop computer that was transmitting Wi-Fi, and uh, three centimeters below the transmitting computer for four hours of exposure. Uh, and they kept the temperature constant. And compared to controls that were incubated in the same conditions without the RF exposure, they saw a decrease in progressive sperm, increase in immobility, increase in fragmented DNA. Now, if I'm going to talk about this subject, I have to talk about the risk of brain tumors with cell phones. Because every three years, you read an article in the media saying, another study has shown there isn't a risk. And these articles were written by journalists who read the summary of the study but didn't look at the data. Mm. <laughs> the Interphone study published in 2010 is one that was quoted as saying that there was no risk. They said there was no trend of increasing risk. This study was a large study done at multiple centers, and it was funded in significant part by the telecommunications industry. Um, and they stratified their data out. They called somebody who was exposed, anyone that used a cell phone, oh, once in uh, one call a week for at least six months. They considered you in the risk group. So they had a lot of people in the risk group who didn't have a whole lot of hours of use. And that kind of diluted the risk group out some. 
<laughs> at the very top end with greater than 1,640 hours of lifetime exposure, they saw a significant increase in risk for gl 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 glioma. Um, but what they said in their summary was, we didn't see any trend of increasing risk. Because it doesn't trend up, it just goes flat till you get to a threshold and then you've got a problem. And the, the journalists said, oh, they didn't see a trend. Um, if we look at the data for the top exposed group, this is the odds ratio for meningioma in that group, uh, stratified by hours of use. In the highest use group, if they accumulated those hours in less than in four years or less, this was their risk, as compared to five to nine years, ten years. And this slide shows the with the risk of it being was the tumor on the same side that they held the cell phone on. And statistically, there was a significant, it was twice as likely, that tumor was twice as likely to be found on the same side of their head as where they held the cell phone in the highest use cohort. This shows risk of acoustic neuroma on the same side versus the opposite side with less than five years of cell phone use. This is all from the Infone study. And here's the odds risk for a brain tumor of any kind, glioma or meningioma with greater than seven years of use. This is from their latest published data. And the Interphone study, at this point, when this was published in 2011, the authors could no longer say that they couldn't find any evidence of increased risk. So what they said in their summary was they couldn't find any evidence of increased risk with less than 10 years of exposure. And that was what was reported in the media. And with this study, they said, well, we did see this increased trend in people with greater levels of exposure, but the data really needs to be replicated. Even though this data was a replication of their previous study, and it's replicated by all the studies done by the group in Sweden that isn't funded by the cell phone industry. And that group is the Hardell group. Um, they're one of the first groups to start studying this. The cell phone rollout happened first in Scandinavia. Cell phones were invented there. They had networks before anybody else. And doctors there were the first people to start wondering if they were seeing more brain tumors from this. Um, this group also controlled for use of, of portable phones in the home, the in-home cordless phones. Now, what we've got here is cordless phones, mobile phones, both. And this is the risk by years of use for glioma, one kind of type of brain tumor. This is the risk for astrocytoma, stratified in the same way. This is the risk for a brain tumor by whether the cell phone's on the same side as where the tumor was or not. Same side, opposite side, people who are ambidextrous. And this is cumulative hours of use of any brain cancer. By the time there's two thousands of use, we've got over twice the risk. Tumor risk of any brain cancer by age of first use, if people start using cell phones before they're 20, the risk is significantly higher because their skull is thinner. And uh, this is the risk for astrocytoma uh, by uh, age of first use. This is cordless phone, this is cell phone, and this is both. So someone who starts using a cell phone at age, age less than 20 years has uh, almost five times as much risk of developing an astrocytoma. And that's the data uh, that's showing in the research today. This is a much larger, that's my last slide. There's a lot more. Uh, discussion of this in the details in the handouts that I've provided you with.